And I felt special that I'd gone to somewhere where Jesus was born there and Jesus did this and, and to the olive gardens and everything. On her father's deathbed, he accepted Islam. I, I feel embarrassed because there is this is going on in the world, isn't it? Asalaamu As Alaikum and welcome back to my channel. I hope you're all doing really well, inshallah. Today we have my mum again. Hello, hi. And we are back to do another reaction video. Today we're reacting to the story of the famous journalist who converted to Islam, Lauren Booth. Does the name Lauren Booth ring any bells no, to you? I no, I don't know. I thought you might have known yeah. it. I thought that it'd be quite a good idea to show my mum some people from the UK that have converted to Islam. Lauren Booth is actually the sister-in-law of Tony Blair. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. 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 So for those of you that aren't aware who Tony Blair is, he was a Prime Minister of the UK. How many years ago do you oh, think? Um, 10 years ago? No, maybe, maybe more. more. 15 yeah. years ago? I'm not sure, Rebecca. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, he was the Prime Minister and Lauren Booth is his sister-in-law. Now, she found Islam... I think about 14 years ago. She has done a lot of amazing work in Palestine and she's really well known as being a journalist. So I thought this story would be really nice to watch with my mom. I did actually watch it when I was doing my research into Islam. Uh -huh. I found her story oh, really gosh. inspiring. I've shown you quite a few stories already of people converting to Islam. Uh -huh. One being the funny Aussie. Yes. Remember uh, him? Yeah, yeah. I like that. And then most recently we watched the story of the man who was writing an anti-Islam book. Uh-huh. Do you remember him? Yes, I think uh -huh. he's from the Netherlands. Yes. I think, yes, yeah. yeah. It would be nice to show you somebody from... Britain that has become Muslim. Yes. So let's give it a watch together, inshallah. How did you first hear about Islam? What was your last step towards accepting Islam? And how was your family's reaction? I was in an elevator going, oh God, big Arab man with a gun, bigger Arab man with a gun. Kill the white woman later. And the translation that my mind gave me, we'll kill the white woman later. And I said, no, there's no way I can be Muslim. No way, not me. Mm, mm, mm. And I closed the Quran and I thought, oh my God, nice people, crazy book. Assalamu alaikum, Sister Lauren. Thank you for accepting our invitation. We are very happy to have you with us. I want to start with who is Lauren Booth? Can you briefly introduce yourself? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. My name is Lauren Booth. I am a journalist and a writer and an actor. So I was born in 1967 in Hampstead, North London. My mum was a model. My dad was an actor. And I stayed in London until I was 20. I was studying acting. Uh, that was my big dream. I wanted to go to Hollywood. So after acting uh, for seven years, I retrained as a journalist in 1997 and I do a lot of TV as well so I appeared on Sky News. I was in uh, mainstream journalism. I was working for people like the Daily Mail, don't judge me, Mail on Sunday. I did stuff for the BBC and Channel 5, hosted lots of TV shows, alhamdulillah, radio shows. So in 2010, I accepted Islam. And this was after a series of journeys to Palestine, meeting the people there, going first as a journalist and then as an activist. How did you first hear about Islam? I guess the first time I really took notice of Islam was in 2001 after 9-11. I remember watching the footage seeming to show planes go into the Twin Towers and I was sitting with a young child thinking, what poor country is going to be made to pay for this? And in my mind, I was a socialist and a leftist and I understood the West has a war with certain people for power. I'm like, some poor country with nothing to do with this is going to be made to pay in order for America to feel good about itself again. Afghanistan. If Islam was a threat to the West, it had been around for 1400 years and billions of people followed it. They could have just taken the West or done awful things. So one act does not mean the whole of the Muslim world is responsible for one act by a small group of people. What is that? It's a political decision to impact and inflict upon Muslim people. And I didn't get behind that. I couldn't in my heart get behind that. We know that as a journalist, you have been in Palestine many times. 
Why did you first decide to go there? I felt a hand, an invisible hand on my back, propelling me towards Palestine. I have no explanation for it. I didn't speak Arabic. I didn't know any Palestinians. But I honestly felt absolutely a hand on my back going, go to Palestine, go to Palestine, go to Palestine. So, and I found myself in the West Bank on my own with no training. Can you tell us about your experience in Palestine? I think it's really important to understand that I went to the Holy Land as a Christian, but I was super excited to walk in the steps of Jesus Christ. That to me, I was like on a pilgrimage. Everywhere it was like, oh my God, Jesus might have been here. <laughs> It was amazing. I never expected to go to Jerusalem where he dragged the cross and uh, to go to the Holy Sepulchre and oh my God, Jesus was here. This is amazing. It really happened. But everywhere that I started to go in the Middle East, it was the Muslims who were looking after the Christian sites. And that really confused me. So for example, the place where Jesus, peace be upon him, cured the lepers is a cave in Lebanon. And attached to the cave is a church. And the man who opens it is a Muslim. And I said, okay, why do you have the key? to this. He said, it's been in my family for generations. And I said, can I ask you something? He said, yes. I said, did your family steal them from the Christians? Maybe they killed the Christians to get them. He's like, you really don't know much about, about this. No, the Christians trust us with these because we care about Jesus too. And I was like, that was the first time I'm like, Jesus is your prophet? Okay. And they, the Muslims seem to know a lot more about him as well. Muslims mm -hmm. seem to know a lot about Jesus. You know, I had an incredible journey for two weeks and I was shocked that this is the world that we live in, that everything I thought I knew about the Middle East was a lie. Do you recognise her? No, I don't recognise her at all. But yeah. then when she said of like Sky News and I've never ever really watched Sky well, News. Well, Daily so Mail, I think she yeah, said, and BBC. I've never been a reader of newspapers. So, uh, yeah, but yeah, yeah I can... I, it's, uh, yeah. Maybe I, without the hijab going back you years, might maybe you do yeah. then. Yes, I might well do then. The one thing that hit me then was... <laughs> sorry. <laughs> The one thing that hit me was the fact that um, the Twin Towers, you, we never thought then, did we, who'd be getting the blame or anything for that, did we? Yeah. We never thought that, you know, and obviously, yes, it would be all the Muslims, wouldn't it, you know? And and it's sad to think that that's how the world was was um, portraying that, isn't it? Yeah. And I'd never thought about that till right now, watching that. Yeah, I and think that sad, they, isn't it? Yeah, they like to tar all Muslims with the same brush, unfortunately. Yes. Mm. And especially at the moment as well, with everything that's currently going on in Palestine, for some reason, the Muslims mm. are the ones that are getting it. Oh, no. You know, Muslim hate oh, no. in the UK is up by 300%. Uh -huh. And it's especially against women, because we're so obviously Muslim wearing the hijab. Yes. Uh -huh. And it is, it's really upsetting and really worrying as well that these politicians, you know, put this out and they don't understand the backfire. I know, and they're sitting in an office somewhere, aren't they, with um, all the benefits. Many years ago, so how long ago? I'd be about 25, so a long time ago. I went on a, on a holiday to Cyprus and there was two choices of, of overnight uh, trips. One was with to Egypt, by boat, both of them. One was to Egypt and one was to Israel, as, as I thought it was then, you know. And um, we couldn't, I wanted to go to, to um, Egypt. I, you know, who doesn't want to go see the pyramids? Yeah. And thankfully we've been, we managed to go, me and you. For some reason, I don't remember why, but we couldn't go to Egypt, it wasn't... It wasn't open for us, or I don't know whether there was any unrest in Egypt at that time. But we, so the only trip we could go on was to go to Israel, or the West Bank, and so um, we did. Me and my ex-husband. I felt like, like the lady speaking then. I felt special that I'd gone to somewhere where Jesus was born there, and Jesus did this, and and to the olive gardens and everything that you know we did on that trip and I just loved it although it brought sadness as well because when we walked through the city in Jerusalem it was um, uh, full of armed guards for one thing and lots of children like no older than I wouldn't have said they were older than three or four years old 
begging and throwing things on you to buy. And it was, so it was sad because, you know, back then, and just like now in Britain, we we don't know all these things that are going on unless you travel. Yeah. It's, you know, it was sad. Now you hear more about, you know, the troubles and everything. And this has been going on for a long time, hasn't it? 75 years or so. Yeah. And so you, you don't know what you were led to believe or, you know. But it was special. It was yeah. special. It was special I as think, well. though, that you weren't really aware of the situation in Palestine. But me and you have had many discussions about it, haven't mm-hmm. we, other, even months before October. Uh-huh. We no, had definitely. a lot of discussions yes. about it. And I maybe kind of taught you some things that you weren't aware of. Mm-hmm. Because before I became Muslim, I wasn't fully aware about what was going on in Palestine. I, I wasn't know. aware about it at all because it's really not covered across our news. Mm-hmm. We don't hear about it. Um, it was social media really where I learned a lot about Palestine and you know the difficulties that they go through on a daily basis. Now, like if you go anywhere, you can come back home, or you can just look on your phone while you're yeah. on, the, while you're abroad, or whatever, and find out more. We couldn't do that then. We didn't have any of that, you know. Yeah, no. So it was only led to social media that you'd hear. The social media was the news, and yeah. that was it. Whereas now it's so much more. You can look into things a lot more, can't you? So yeah, yeah. definitely. Did you have any prejudice against Islam? And if you had any, how did it go away? When I was going to meet Mahmoud Abbas. So there's me. Western journalist who usually writes about parties going, oh God, big Arab man with a gun, bigger Arab man with a gun. And then I remember that I was in an elevator and one of the uh, Arab guards went, <sighs> you know, that's how it entered my ears. And the translation that my mind gave me in big letters was, we'll kill the white woman later. <laughs> right? And I realized, oh my God, I've taken it all in. I'm not a fair person to come here. I have absolute prejudice. I'm more afraid of a Palestinian with a gun than Israeli with a gun. Why is that? I don't know either of them. So I had to kind of acknowledge my own prejudice, but here's the miracle. After 72 hours on my own in the West Bank, I would have died protecting any any woman or child or man for that matter because of the love that they showed and the kindness and just the, the whole atmosphere that I came to realize was their religion. Do you have any memory that you cannot forget? On the trip in 2005, at the end of the trip, I had all the bags and bags of souvenirs. And I asked the young man who was shopping with me, can you please find me a Quran in English? And he looked like, okay. I'm like, I didn't think one had been written. I mean, why would anybody translate a small Middle Eastern religion? Why would they bother translating it into English? So, so I didn't expect him to find one. So he goes, you know, Quran in glazy, Quran in glazy. And he comes back and he's got the Quran in English. And I'm like, okay, great. And then I look at it and it's like 600 pages. I'm like, never going to read this. And then I remember I asked this young shabab from Jerusalem, how much do I owe you? Because he's been shopping with me. So he starts, he goes like this, what's well, 100, 250, 400 and 600%. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to get fleeced here. I'm going to get done. And then he does this, he goes, ah, forget it. You don't owe us anything. What? He said, the only thing I'm going to ask you is don't forget Palestine when you go. Don't forget about us. Yeah, subhanAllah. That's really impressive. And what was the most surprising event in Palestine? For example, I was, it was January and I didn't know it got cold in the Middle East. And so I didn't have a coat and I remember walking down the street in Ramallah and an old lady in a hijab looks at me and she says something in Arabic and then she grabs me by the arm and I'm like, okay, is this a granny kidnapping? Is this how it happens? And uh, she looked me up and down and then she took me to her bedroom, opened a wardrobe, took out a big overcoat, put it on me and said, yalla. And I'm like, well, oh, what? She wrote down her number and said, there you go. And I'm like, what? I could just walk off with this coat. She could not bear for a stranger to be in her town and cold while she had a coat in her cupboard. Do you get what I'm saying? Allahu Akbar. And everywhere I went, there was such a softness, such an ability to make the best of things. What really struck me was that at the time, I had a a French farmhouse, a French barn being built. I had a swimming pool. I had a one acre garden. I had beautiful children and a great husband and everything. And, but if one thing went wrong, I was be in internally disturbed. So like if the editor wasn't happy with the job, oh, the whole house was in uproar. Oh my God, I'm under stress, I'm under stress, I'm under stress. You know, one tiny thing, everything needed to be perfect or I was not in a calm place. And these people, children killed by the army, homes taken by occupiers, just the daily neglect of their areas and the oppression. And they were like, salam, peace, how are you? Have some of our food, you know, sahten. They had this 
Mexico. And I asked them, why are you so generous? Why are you okay with this? And they said, it's that book, it's the Quran. Allah will make things okay. So when did you really feel the attraction towards Islam? I remember in 2008, as a non-Muslim, I was stranded in Gaza, under siege with those people who are still under siege to this day. And it was Ramadan, and I saw that the people were doing kind deeds for each other, even though they were poor. So I thought one day, let me do a kind deed and take some lamb to a family in Rafa refugee camp. So I took this food to a Muslim family in a refugee camp. The mother opened the door, Tafadel, salam alaikum. So full of light and noor, and she was living in a cell, nothing to eat, nothing to drink. And I said to her, why? you fasting? I said, I don't think your God loves you. I'm sorry to say it. I don't think he does. Why does he make you a Gazan thirsty for 30 days when on day 31, do you have water? She's like, no, we don't have water. I'm like, well, so what then? On day 30 days, you in Gaza, you're going without food. Day 31, is your fridge going to be full? She said, no, it will not be full. I said, well then, your God doesn't love you. You know, give me one good reason why you're fasting. And she said, in a room of nothing, I fast in Ramadan to remember the poor. And that I thought at that moment, if this is Islam, let me be Muslim. Because if there is a faith where you can believe in God and be grateful when you, he's given you nothing that day, if there is a faith where you have one bowl of food and you give it to a stranger, oh my God, wow. This must be it. This must be it. I actually feel really emotional watching that. I oh know, me too, me too, me too. <laughs> Honestly. You feel embarrassed. <laughs> I feel embarrassed because there is this is going on in the world, isn't it? I know. And it's so sad. So sad, isn't it? Uh -huh. The thing that amazes everybody about mm -hmm. the Palestinians is their faith that they have in God. And they never question, why have I been put in this situation? Yeah. They never question it. They're always upbeat themselves. I know. They don't see that they're poor. Do yeah, they, they just want to mean? do everything they can to yeah. help others. Like yeah. that lovely lady uh -huh. sees Lauren in the street and I runs know, and gives, gives her a jacket. Her, I know. You I wouldn't know. get that in the UK. I know. I need to <laughs> dry my eyes. I, you wouldn't so. get that over I know. here. You I just know. wouldn't. I know. People barely even say hi to each other in the street. I know. I know. Never You're mind. Right. Never mind being like that. We moan about things and you know constantly, don't we? Yeah. You know? and, uh, there's nothing to moan about, is no. there? There's nothing to moan about. You said that they gave you the Quran. And then what happened? Did you read it? So I had this holy Quran given to me as a gift and I opened it one day when my children were at work and I thought, okay, I'll wash my hands. I know they wash their hands and this is a very serious book. I took it seriously. It wasn't my scripture, but it was a scripture. It might be a real scripture. So let me read it with respect. So I read Al-Fatiha and I thought, okay, that's like the Lord's Prayer. Same thing. Worship God alone. Ask him alone. Thank him alone. Don't be evil. Do good. I'm fine. So Surah Al-Fatiha was fine. It was in line with my Christian beliefs, but then came Surah Baqarah and you get to before it says there are those who say that they are believers but in their heart is hypocrisy and you know they know they're not telling the truth and Allah hates the liars I mean basically it was calling me out on my hypocrisy and telling me that I was going to go to the hellfire because I believed in God but I wasn't doing anything about it and I was making bad decisions and not being a good person and not worshipping and not bothered about it and I was lying and I closed the Quran and I thought oh my god I had this cold feeling. It was a hot day, but it, absolute terror. And for me, the Quran was terrifying. So I took it and I put it on a high shelf and I thought, wow, nice people, crazy book. Because I'd never seen God so angry before. And he was angry at me. Did you get dawa from Muslims? I did get dawa actually from one place during my journey. There was one group of people who were very specific with me. Do you know who they were? Somali taxi drivers. They don't mess. They don't give like la 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 la. And I found them giving me dawa. So I would say assalamu alaikum because I'd been to Palestine and I thought that meant hello. And they said, Walikum salam, are you Muslim? No, but I'm interested. Oh boy, be careful because you are gonna get you're gonna get a durs right there. You're gonna get a khutbah from your driver. And I really enjoyed them. And so they would say, Well, as the Prophet peace be upon him said to Aisha, da 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 da. And I was learning about this amazing, this wonderful man who'd lived 1400 years ago in an Arabian desert and couldn't read or write, but taught people to change themselves and change the world. And I, I fell in love with Muhammad, peace be upon him. What was your last step? 
towards accepting Islam? I got offered a job at the Islam Channel around 2007 because I was um, advocating for Palestinian justice and also for the people of Iraq. And uh, Muhammad Ali of the Islam Channel offered me the job and I said, I have a couple of conditions. Number one, don't talk to me about Islam because I think it's very nice and I think you people are very nice, but it's not for me. And number two, I won't wear hijab on your TV station because I think it denigrates and it controls women and I don't want to be a hypocrite. And he said, Allah will decide whether or not you're going to be a Muslim. That's not in my hands. And I said, no, there's no way I can be Muslim. No way, not me. Mm -mm -mm. And then Muhammad Ali said, you might be a Muslim. I said, I am not going to be. He said, well, Allah knows. I said, all right. I said, what about hijab? He said, okay, don't wear hijab, but please dress as modestly as you can. And we'll accept that. And so that meant that I started traveling the world, interviewing speakers, sheikhs, having access to more Muslims and more people speaking about Islam. And uh, I went to Iran in 2010 and I went to as a journalist, as a correspondent, to report on the Al Quds Day rally. It was always about Palestine for me. So I was in Iran, and it was uh, we were we reached Qom. We were having a trip away, and it was Ramadan. And I went into this mosque. And when I went into the mosque, I thought, okay, I think I might have done a full wudu, but I definitely, yeah, I think I did wudu with my friend who I was traveling with. And when I crossed the threshold, I made a dua, and I said, to, Oh Allah, thank you for everything you've given me. And I'm not going to ask you for anything else because you've given me so much. But please bless Palestine. And then I went to look around and I went to report secretly. I had an iPhone with me and I thought, wow, this is an exclusive. You're in an Iranian shrine in Ramadan. You've got a great story. You can sell it around the world. That was, I was not in a religious state of mind. I was not, oh, I want to be Muslim. I went in to be nosy and to maybe take some secret pictures. But when we got to the main area, I sat down and it was just like I was sitting under a waterfall of peace. It was like every worry I'd ever had left me. My heart was completely completely at peace. I didn't even know my own name. I was completely not Lauren Booth, whatever that creation, self-creation, self-esteem nonsense, whatever that was, is, it was gone. And it was the best feeling and I didn't want to move. And so I slept the night in the mosque. In the morning I made wudu and I prayed Fajr and I knew, I knew in my heart. At that point I was Muslim. At that point I knew God was one and the Prophet Muhammad were 100%, 100%. And then what happened? How did the people around you react? I didn't want to get on a plane back to London without taking my shahada, but I couldn't find anyone because my flight was six o'clock in the morning. So I went into a mosque in London. You know what, subhanAllah, whoa. When I said the shahada, ashadu, poof. It was like cement slabs falling from my mouth. It was like gold bars leaving my tongue. Ashadu la ilaha illallah, poof. It was like there was an earthquake. Ashadu ana Muhammadin abduhu rasulullah, poof. And it fell to the ground. Wow, it was monumental. And I felt like I was suddenly in a big cotton wool ball. It was like being in cotton wool. It was like just fluffy. And everything kind of went distant. The next day when I was taking my kids to school, they ran off in front of me and I left the house and, and I thought, oh, you haven't got your hijab on. And I'm like, oh, come on. You're not in Iran now. You haven't got your hijab on. You haven't got your hijab on. You're naked. And I could not leave my, the front door of my house. I had to go and find the one scarf that somebody had gave me and kind of pull it on in some weird, really awkward way and walk the girls to school in the scarf. And they said, Mum, why are you wearing hijab? I said, it's cold. They said, it's hot. I said, whatever, just go and play in the walk in the woods. And uh, when I got to school, one of the dads worked for the Jewish Chronicle and he kind of looked like, oh, this is big news. And I'm like, oh man, I'm in so much trouble now. He was like, yes, like all his Christmases had come at once, but I didn't care. I went home and for the next seven days, everything was changed. I I wanted to pray, I wanted to cry to Allah. I put my head to the ground like I'd seen the Muslims do. And I said two things over and over again. I just said, thank you. And I said, sorry. I said, thank you for giving me this life, for giving me all the love that I've had, everything that I haven't recognized. You know, beautiful daughters, I've known love, I've had opportunity, I've had a good family, and I know you and thank you. And then I said, sorry, just a lot of sorry. And I cried a lot for about a week. But then I had to pick up the Quran again, and that was scary. So th that I took my shahad on a Friday, and my children with their father, we were divorced or separated. And that Friday night, I'm like, okay, great. The kids, are, I took my shahad, I go home, and I sit there, and I'm like, right, Friday night, let me call a male friend. Oh, you can't really do that. It's, 
Yeah. Uh, let me have a cigarette. I don't really want to have a cigarette when I know I'm going to pray and say Allah's name. So then I went to my fridge and there was a bottle of wine. I went, oh, okay, so this is going to be a boring life. So there was literally nothing to do. So I picked the Quran up again. And I was like, oh God, Ya Allah, please let this have a good ending. Please let this not be, I'm now going to help. Don't let me have got this wrong. I trust you. And the Quran just said, welcome, where have you been? God loves you. You've made the right choice and everything's going to be okay. Amazing, really. And how was your family's reaction? So I thought it would be a big deal when my family found out I was Muslim. My mum was very sarcastic, said, you've joined the lunatics, you've joined the crazy people, you're, you're, are you going to be a terrorist? She had a lot of fear. But I became a better daughter, inshallah. I worked really hard at loving her for the last years of her life and putting things right. I mean, my dad was just afraid. Why, as a free woman, would you be dressed like this? Why would you let a man put that on you? Because God doesn't want you to wear it. Men have told you to wear this. I'm like, well, I'm wearing this for God, all right? And he's like, but you can go to God anyway. You don't have to go like this. So he was worried about any marriage that I had. Are you going to be servile? You know, are you going to be a servant? He said, all oh, my daughters are strong women. And I'm like, you don't get it. A... But subhanAllah, I, I got to have a discussion with my dad on his deathbed, subhanAllah. And I got to read him alpha and I got to hold his hand and look deep into his, his eyes and, and share spirituality and love for God with him. And he said that God is one and the Prophet Muhammad is the last Prophet and Jesus is a Prophet. So Allah knows best. He didn't say it in Arabic and I didn't push it, but he has had always said to me, there's one God, Jesus is a Prophet. And I said, the Prophet Muhammad was a great man who was a Prophet. He said, okay, I believe that he was a Prophet. And uh, I had a lovely dream about him after he passed, that he was being washed by three Imams and full of light. So in a shot. It's very interesting, isn't it? It is, yeah. yeah. It is very interesting. How passionate she is as well about yeah. what she was learning. I think her story is just so, so lovely, yeah. really nice. Uh -huh. And I think as well you can relate with someone, especially when they're British. I know, I think yes, you can definitely. With them more. Yes, I think that is an, one good thing, isn't it, as well? Because um, in, hopefully, it'll, you know, people feel more and more at ease to be able to do that because it's a probably is a big thing for some folk yeah. to make that decision, you know. Definitely. Mm. Still, even nowadays, it's still really difficult to speak to your parents about it. And the reaction of her parents is so common. So know, common. That's the first thought people have is, oh, you're going to be dressing like that for a man. And, I know. Eh? Or you're going to be a terrorist now. This is I so know, common. I know. So common. To, that, to come from a family member, a close family member yeah. as well. At that time, you were working in an English news channel. What happened there? So, and the first morning I went to the Sky News in a hijab was hilarious because, you know, they're all trained to be very cool customers. Whatever walks into the studio, you're like, but you could see everyone going, oh, my God, have you seen? You know, as you walk past, it was like, hi, Lauren. You know, I could just see what was happening behind me. Two days later, I got a call saying, Lauren, we're jiggling things around. We won't be needing you anymore. Cut. They didn't use me anymore, ever again. Now, are there hijabis on Sky News? Yes, mashallah. Are there hijabis in the news world? Yes. Have you ever seen a convert hijabi who's in news? Name one. Now, this is a struggle that the mainstream world has because if you accept that Islam is your faith, Allah is your Lord, then by the media standards, you've either had a nervous breakdown or you've had a nervous breakdown. I don't think there is even is a B. How can they present you as a thinking, intelligent, credible person who, in the middle of their life, says, morning everybody, my name is Lauren Booth, by the way, I believe Allah is God and Prophet Muhammad was the last prophet now to weather, you know, <laughs> you can't do that. They can have brown people on who have hijab because, oh, that's their weird, their little thing. But if you're from the mainstream, how can that be normalized without having a conversation about God and about Islam and about what we do to Muslims and how we treat the Muslim world? I come with that conversation now and I embrace it. Alhamdulillah, I embrace it. Was there someone that met Islam and changed their life in your circle? I was on a plane a few years ago coming back from Qatar and the man in front of me was a British man in a vest smelling of alcohol and he was a skinhead and I'm like, oh, please God, I don't want to sit next to him for four hours. And so my ticket is 21G, he's 21F. So we go and sit down and I have to get over him and he looks at me like I'm absolute dirt. He looks at me like, ugh. So the food comes and, and he's like, yeah, I'll have a vodka and I'll have a beer and I'll have, and I'm like, ugh. 
So I'm just having a drink of water going, oh, Allah, forgive me, this is the worst flight ever. And then he says, um, would you like the water? As if I can't speak English. So I'm like, oh, thank you very much. So I'm like, okay, I have to do a good deed now. I'll give him something. Would you like my cheese? He's like, thank you very much. And he says, where are you from? <laughs> Mate, I'm from London. Where are you from? He's like, what? You <laughs> dress like this? From London? And he looks away and he does something really strange. He starts sitting there and he's going, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And I look at him and I'm like, you okay? He's like, yeah, but I was thinking horrible things about you and I'm sorry. And I said to him, you didn't say them, <laughs> okay? So it's okay, don't worry. Long story short, over four hours, we get speaking. I find out that he tells me that he's depressed. He doesn't want to live. He's a bad man. And I said to him, you know, everybody can have these moments, but we pray to God. Who do you pray to? Who do you reach out to? He said, I don't believe in any of that. I said, there's somebody, there's something that you go to when you're in the state. He said, well, I have a picture of my mum and and sometimes I cry to her and say, Mom, help me. It's a 40 year old man in pain. I said to him, okay, was your mom religious? He said, yeah, she used to pray a lot. I said, who did she, your, your mom used to pray to? He said, God. I said, how about next time you feel like this, you pray to the one you ma your mom prayed to? And it was like, a light bulb went on. Yeah, you're right, you're right, okay. And I had a Quran in English in my bag, by the grace of Allah, and I gave it to him. And this big guy, you know, big British guy, was getting off the plane going, thank you. So, subhanAllah, people need, people need help. We have to be access points, inshallah. And so I'm devoted to, to creating that, to crafting output, looks after our young Muslims, gives us places to feel proud of our heritage, to look forward to what we can do with it. And look also for non-Muslims and people who are doubting to ask their questions, inshallah. And that, that's a good cause. Can you tell us about your projects you did and future projects? You know, my big project is to reveal how the Muslim attitude to this world. What is tired? What is the goodness? How do we revive it now? And how do we live it in our lives? Alhamdulillah. Well, I think one of the big projects that really moves me is to speak to the Muslims about how great our heritage is and how we can reflect on that and be great again. Alhamdulillah. I wrote a book called In Search of a Holy Land. I made it also, by the grace of Allah, into an audio book so people can listen to it. That's online. And so I worked with a producer to create my book into a play. And we've performed it, it's called Accidentally Muslim. We played to 900 mostly non-Muslims at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. You know, I love to, to show Islam as, as it truly is an impact on the heart and a positive impact on society. If you had a chance to speak to all the non-Muslims in the world, what would you like to say if you had just one minute? <sighs> Oh, you sitting at home now, you have times when you don't know why you're alive. You have times of sadness and loss and grief, and the fun just isn't working the way it used to. You have pain, and maybe sometimes you don't know why you're alive, and you want to ask somebody to help you, but you don't know how to ask, and everything feels like it's strange and unreal. God is one. When you feel like this, look at a rose. Look at a rose in the garden and think that it makes scent for us. When you feel like this, look at the bees and just think, how amazing that honey is so tasty, and it's also a healing. We give it for sore throats. Just think about how nature is there for us and how beautiful it is that the rain goes into the ground, into the roots of the trees, and then the trees grow a leaf or a flower, and then that flower becomes fruit that we can just eat, and it has goodness for us, and feel the loving and benevolent presence of your Lord. Thank you, Sister Lauren, for being with us. Hope we will meet in other projects too. Inshallah. Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh, we've all done that, haven't we? Sat on a flight and thought, oh, we're next to somebody like yeah. this or somebody like that. At the end of the day, they're human beings, aren't they? You never know what somebody's going through. I know. And the fact that she <laughs> reached out to him herself, but she didn't push her own religion, did she? You know, she says... Go to, with the one that your mum believed in, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, this has been <laughs> torture, hasn't it, for me? But what did you think about her story, though, to I finding know. Islam? I know, I thought it was really good because it wasn't like she just gave in to it, is it? She questioned it all along, didn't yeah. she? And, and um, even though, I mean, she got basically got sacked from her, her job yeah, you know and so it bad. is and I can see that happening whereas people you know when you, um, you see 
sort of British, very British looking people mm -hmm. with scarves on, you just assume, oh, you know, why, you know, yeah. isn't it? But like you say, you, you see people with darker skin, it's, it's just, you it's know, you enormous. understand it more, yeah. don't you? And it is terrible because that is discrimination. Yeah. The fact that people are working in that industry, industry, and yet somebody's reverted reverted to it yeah. yeah and yet they're getting punishment because they're thinking they won't believe in her as a as a as a uh, news reader yeah that's not that shallow minded isn't it, it? Is, it is. it's so funny because as well as as a carer if i like you know that i have been for a long long time a carer home worker and um, we'd get you, you know, you'd be going in and out of people's houses and they'd say, oh, have you met so-and-so? And I said, well, oh, no, no, I haven't. And because I worked on my own mostly, you wouldn't meet the other carers that often. And then you'd be saying, oh, gosh, well, she's wearing a scarf to work. And I said, oh, right, well, you know. And I never, I've never, I just, and when I did eventually meet these people at team meetings or whatever, I used to just chat to them still to this day um, I, I I do that because I, I always whenever I see somebody that isn't the norm as you would see in Britain I've just tried to be friendly with them thinking that not many people are talking to or they're all talking about her behind their back and yeah. so I've just you know it's just dreadful isn't it that's a bad British thing to it do is. isn't it you know it and, is, yeah uh, I like the fact that she said she was it, what came out of it for her was it made her a better a better daughter for her mother yeah. now you and I'm going to say this you didn't need to do that because you were already a really good daughter to me you always have been but you see that the benefits in that because there's so many uh, daughters that just gradually like daughter's sons it's a natural thing to do is you grow up and as you grow up your parent you need your parent less and less and then you make your own lives yeah. and you just um it easily gets diluted doesn't it and you think oh i haven't been to see my mum for so many weeks or i haven't spoken to them or whatever but it's easy to do that but i think the thing with your religion is that's a big thing isn't it especially your mum yeah. and yeah and whether your mum is getting old and crotchety or old and not being able to understand you the same as you did years ago it doesn't matter does no, it? it it doesn't, doesn't matter I think as well that it's so lovely that on her father's deathbed he accepted Islam he accepted that there's one mm -hmm. true God he accepted that Muhammad peace be upon him was a me the last and final messenger and he always believed that Jesus, peace be upon him, was also a messenger. And for her dad to, in the beginning, say, oh, you're mm. going to be dressing like that for a yes. man, uh -huh. to then in the end actually accepting Islam himself. And yeah, he didn't say it in Arabic, but he accepted it in English. And yeah. inshallah, that is enough yes. for him uh -huh. to be in Jannah now, inshallah. Mm. Uh -huh. So I just think her story is so beautiful. And especially where she started out and she went to Palestine and she was a bit worried. Yeah. And like she said there that a Palestinian man with a gun gave her the fear, whereas an Israeli man with a gun didn't. I know. And it's because that's yeah. what we are led to believe know, in this country. I know. Uh -huh. Which is so crazy because, I mean, I felt the same way about Muslims going back years ago. I was petrified of Muslims from what I'd heard in the news. Yeah, you see, I... I know, probably because of my job as a carer and you see so many people with uh, um, many backgrounds and lots of, you know, people from other parts of Europe even, you're yeah. used to. I mean, that's what it, the workplace is like now in Britain, isn't it? Going back then, things probably weren't as open as they are soon yeah. now. Mm -hmm. But also I think it's really special to see somebody that's older accepting Islam and not yeah. somebody that's younger because... I think the prime age of people accepting Islam is around about their 20s. Uh -huh. So when you see somebody that's older than that and they've lived a life, they've been married, they have kids of their own, to then really look into a complete different religion to what they were ever taught growing up, I think that's something that's really beautiful as I well. I know, and the remarkable thing as well I took out of that as well is she had everything. Yeah. She had everything and... Um, it, uh, a little problems 
well, major because that's what we do in this country, isn't it? Yeah. You know, I mean, you get stressed out and that's it, Definitely, you know, and yeah. it's the end of the world. But she had a lot to lose and she lost her job. But it didn't matter, did it? Yeah. You know, she probably wasn't thinking about her massive house and this and that because it's all materialistic, it isn't is, it? Yeah. And she stuck by what she, you know, how she questioned herself going out the front door without a scarf on yeah. and taking her children to school and then, oh, no, I have to do it. There's so much more to life, there isn't is, there? There is, there yeah. is, yeah. I just think she's such a great role model to people and she's so active in her work with the Palestinians as well. And I really She's a very positive person listening to her. She's, yeah. she's, she's all there, isn't she? Yeah. You know, she's not daft. No, you know, she's not. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. No. yeah, no, she's really great. Uh -huh. Yeah. May Allah bless her. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, give it a thumbs up, give me a comment, let me know what you think, and we will see you in the next video, inshallah. Bye. See you next time. Thank you.